Good morning, everyone. My name is Alan Kay. Welcome to St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church in Maple, Ontario. It is May the 30th, 2021, which is Trinity Sunday. So happy to have you all here with us today. And I look forward to you enjoying either by the live stream or by a video replay uh, and, uh, and uh, enjoying and here, be here while we worship our Lord. And let me, without any further delay, let me turn it over to Robert Hayashi. Well, dear friends, welcome. Welcome to St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church here in Maple, Ontario. And know that it is this day, God, the Holy Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit, who welcomes you here this day. And he welcomes you into worship to worship him for all that he has done for you and for this world. So let us hear God's call to worship this day. Let us worship the triune God. Let us worship the one who spoke in the beginning and created something out of nothing. Let us worship the triune God. Let us worship the one who took on the clothing of humanity to set those who were oppressed free. Let us worship the triune God. Let us worship the one whose spirit rests upon us continually, calling us to wholeness and abundance, to bright new beginnings. O oh, blessed Trinity, fill this place and these people with your presence this day. For yours is the power and the salvation and the creation, now and always. Amen. And so perhaps today you are wondering, who else commands all the hosts of heaven? Who else could make every king bow down? Who else can whisper and the darkness trembles? The answer, my friend, is only a holy God. Let us re be reminded of who our God is and who we have come to worship in the singing of our faith with our opening worship song, Only a Holy God, performed by the A Cappella Academy. Who else commands all the hosts of heaven? Worship the holy God. 
who was to rescue me from my failing, who was to offer his only son, who was to advise me to call him father. Only a holy God, come and behold Well, with hearts sometimes filled with joy and sometimes filled with sorrow and with a spirit of humility and faith that has come before God in prayer and with an honesty about who we are today, let us bow down before him and confess our sins. Let us join our hearts in prayer. Let us pray. O oh, holy God, like Isaiah the prophet, we stand in awe of your glory. Feeling tremendously small and overwhelmed by our sin and the sin of our world. Even so, you touch us with your loving presence. The psalmist declares that you have given human beings dominion over the works of your hands. All too often, though, we confuse this holy charge with having ownership. We treat your creation as a resource to be selfishly used for our needs and our profit. We find ourselves reluctant to count the costs of our failure to be your faithful stewards until disaster strikes. And so we pray, show us another way, O oh God, show us another way. Holy God, your cry for wisdom and understanding echoes in our homes, our workplaces, our schools, our church meetings, our legislatures, and our courts. We confess we don't always want to hear that cry, deciding instead to rely on familiar habits, comfortable assumptions, and quick conclusions. We ask you to show us another way, O oh God. Show us another way. Merciful God, the Apostle Paul proclaims peace, hope, and grace are your gifts to us. And yet there are times when grief overwhelms us, anxiety holds us captive, and suffering leaves us numb with despair. We wonder rebelliously if you are at work in our lives, and we long for you to show us another way, O oh God. In this moment of silence, hear our private words of confession. Speak to our hearts, O oh God, and show us another way. O oh God, our creator, continue to build your congregation, this community of faith into what you want us to be. O oh Christ, our savior, lead us to do your will. O oh spirit, our power, strengthen and guide us to do the work of the kingdom. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Grant us your peace. Amen. Well, my friends, hear the good news, that in Christ Jesus, your sins have been forgiven. So as a forgiven people, be merciful in action. 
kind in heart and humble in mind. And above all, and above all, be loving and never forget to be thankful for what Christ has done for you. Thanks be to God. Amen. And so as a forgiving people, being renewed, being given a new life, let us be thankful and live in that joy and live in that peace and share that peace with each other this day. May the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Well, this week in our time with our youth and all those who are young at heart, I had planned to talk about one of the great mysteries of the church and try to find some way to simply explain the Holy Trinity, which is such a complex theological topic. But something else caught my attention that I thought we should discuss. Now this week, Pope Francis announced a further green initiative that builds on his 2015 papal letter around sustainability in the church. Now this new initiative will focus on the greening of the Catholic church, its institutions, including families and households, parishes, dioceses, schools, universities, hospitals, businesses, monasteries, convents, and all Catholic institutions and all institutions that are connected in some way with the Catholic Church. There are reportedly 1.3 billion Catholics in the world, representing approximately 17% of the world's population. So can you just think of the impact on the environment, if each one of those 1.3 billion people took steps to reduce their carbon footprint and move towards sustainability and the preservation of the planet. Now, if you're wondering, the, the Presbyterian Church here in Canada, as far back as 1990, has adopted resolutions at the General Assembly, which is our governing body, uh, to reduce climate change. As wonderful as that is, over the centuries, the church has been guilty of harming others, just as the church and its people have been guilty of harming the environment. And God continues to reveal to us his ways, calling us to care for not only the planet and creation, but for each other. Now the Pope's announcement comes in the same week that a mass grave containing the remains of what is now 215 children uh, was found on the site of the Kamloops Residential School in British Columbia that was operated by the Catholic Church. For the Tecumloops Te Sequemu First Nation, the finding of this mass grave confirms decades of suspicion and speculation and rumors of those missing children. Now, even though the leaders of the First Nation and the Canadian government have called upon the Pope to apologize uh, for the church's role in the suffering and abuse in its residential schools here in Canada, the Catholic Church has yet to do so. Again, in case you're wondering, for its part, the Presbyterian Church in Canada apologized to the people of the First Nations and confessed its guilt in the suffering and abuse in those uh, residential schools back in a ceremony in 1994. It is... To be quite honest, I'm not sure what the lesson here is today. You know, God puts passions in our hearts. Um, you know, for some, it might be athletics, like swimming. For others, it might be um, reading. But God puts passions in our hearts for us to follow. He also puts causes in our hearts 
uh, for us to follow. Things like um, sustainability in the environment, things like social justice, um, fighting for equal rights for all people. But God also puts into our hearts the need to reconcile with others, to say, I'm sorry. Now we as a people find it easy, so very easy to follow our passions. We love doing what we love to do. We love spending our time and our energies and, and fighting for those causes that we truly believe in. It comes so easily for us. But what comes much harder for us is those words, I'm sorry. To be able to sincerely apologize to another for the harm that we have done. And yet, if we listen, God puts that in our hearts. It is hard for us to apologize because our egos and our pride gets in the way. Sometimes even the, the voice of Satan gets in our way, telling us that we don't need to apologize. Those, those people deserved what they got. And yet, God is showing us another way. He shows us another way in the way that we are forgiven by him, in the way that he sent his son for us to pay our price to be forgiven. God shows us another way. And in the course of your life, you will have many passions, and I certainly hope you follow them. I would encourage you to follow them, especially if those passions are about the advancement of God's mission here on earth. Follow them. And if you're wondering how to do so, well, come talk to your church family. We're going to support you in that. And maybe you can't even figure out how to do that passion, right? how to fight that cause. Well, come and talk to us because we're going to help you figure it out. We'll work together to make that passion of yours a reality in the world to serve God's mission as well. If God has put on your heart the need to apologize, the need to say sorry, and you can't figure out how to do it, well, come. Come talk to your church family. Come talk to your family at home. Come talk to someone that you trust. Find the words, especially talk to God. Pray to God. Ask him to help you to say the words, I'm sorry, to those you have hurt or you have harmed. Because in doing that, in saying those words, and asking forgiveness, well, true understanding can begin. True healing can begin. True reconciliation can begin. That's what God wants for us in the world. He not only wants us to follow our passions and fight for social justice, but he also wants to love one another. And one of the ways we can do so is to say, I'm sorry. Well, let's pray together. Creator and ever-present God, thank you for moving in the hearts of your servants, like Pope Francis, to boldly take up your cause of protecting creation. Help the church to also recognize the harm it has done to others and, and confess its sins so healing can begin. Help us to understand how you are moving in our hearts and give us the, the courage to follow what you have set in our hearts and minds through prayer and action. Help us to know the passions that we are supposed to follow and help us to know when we are to say those words, I'm sorry, and give us the courage to do both. We ask your blessing for creation and all those in need and us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And so now let us hear God's holy word. Let us pray. Loving God, attend to us as we open your word today. May our hearts and spirits listen for your will for us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The first part of the Bible reading today is from Psalms, and that's Psalm 29. This is from the New International Version, and this is a Psalm of David. Ascribe to the Lord, you heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. 
Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord thunders over the mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The voice of the Lord breaks in pieces the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon leap like a calf, Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord strikes with flashes of lightning. The voice of the Lord shakes the desert. The Lord shakes the desert of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord twists the oaks and strips the forest bare. And in his temple all cry, glory. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord is enthroned as king forever. The Lord gives strength to his people. The Lord blesses his people with peace. The second part of the reading is from the Gospel of John. That's chapter 3, verse 1 to 17. John chapter 3, verse 1 to 17. The message translation. There was a man of the Pharisee sect, Nicodemus, a prominent leader among the Jews. Late one night, he visited Jesus and said, Rabbi, we all know you are a teacher straight from God. No one could do all the God-pointing, God-revealing acts you do if God weren't in on it. Jesus said, you're absolutely right. Take it from me. Unless a person is born from above, it's not possible to see what I'm pointing to, to God's kingdom. How can anyone, said Nicodemus, be born who has already been born and grown up? You can't re-enter your mother's womb and be born again. What are you saying with this born from above talk? Jesus said, you are not listening. Let me say it again. Unless a person submits to this original creation, the wind hovering over the water creation, the invisible moving the visible, a baptism into a new life, it's not possible to enter God's kingdom. When you look at a baby, it's just that, a body you can look at and touch. But the person who takes shape within it, formed by something you can't see and touch, the spirit, and becomes a living spirit. So don't be surprised when I tell you that you have to be born from above, out of this world, so to speak. You know well enough how the wind blows this way and that. You hear it rustling through the trees, but you have no idea where it comes from or where it's headed next. That's the way it is with everyone born from above by the wind of God, the spirit of God. Nicodemus asks, what do you mean by this? How does this happen? Jesus said, you're a respected teacher of Israel and you don't know these basics? Listen carefully. I'm speaking sober truth to you. I speak of what I know by experience. I give witness only to what I have seen with my own eyes. There is nothing secondhand, no hearsay. Yet instead of facing the evidence and accepting it, you procrastinate with questions. If I tell you things that are plain as the hand before your face and you don't believe me, what use is there in telling you of things you can't see, the things of God? No one has ever gone up into the presence of God except the one who came down from that presence, the Son of Man, in the same way that Moses lifted the serpent in the desert so people could have something to see and then believe. It is necessary for the Son of Man to be lifted up and everyone who looks up to him, trusting and expectant, will gain a real life, eternal life. This is how much God loved the world. He gave his son, his one and only son. And this is why, so that no one need be destroyed. By believing in him, anyone can have a whole and lasting life. God didn't go to all the trouble of sending his son merely to point an accusing finger, telling the world how bad it was. He came to help, 
to put the world right again. Anyone who trusts in him is acquitted. Anyone who refuses to trust him has long since been under the death sentence without knowing it. And why? Because of that person's failure to believe in the one of a kind, Son of God, when introduced to him. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Our next hymn is called Holy, Holy, Holy. Just a small piece of trivia for those of you who might be interested. In the title of this song, Holy, 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 and in another favorite hymn, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, the use of the three holies signifies the Holy Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. It was just something that I happened to, to come upon as I was doing some music research um, several years ago. So now let us pray to God. Eternal God, in the proclaiming of your word, may your message be heard in the meditations of all of our hearts. This day, may your word be known. And in the faithfulness of our lives, may your word be shown. Amen. Well, the message Today is entitled, One Plus One Plus One Equals One. So on Trinity Sunday, when the Christian church around the world celebrates the Holy Trinity, we are reminded that the triune God, that in the triune God, one plus one plus one equals one. But even if you are a math genius, or as Alan had said, a parent struggling with the new math, one plus one plus one equals one doesn't really make sense to us. And it can be the same with the Holy Trinity. We think, how can it be 
that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit can be one God. And yet this seemingly incomprehensible reality is the mystery that is the foundation of the Christian faith. The doctrine of the Trinity is notoriously hard to understand. It is a human attempt to explain who the Christian church has understood God to be through our understanding of scripture. The doctrine of the Trinity is founded on two fundamental theological realities. The first being that there is one true God and the second, that the one true God has eternally existed as three distinct persons, each of whom is equally and fully God. The word Trinity captures these dual truths in a single theological term. As theologian Wayne Grudman explains in his book, Systematic Theology, the word Trinity is never found in the Bible though the idea is represented by the word is taught in many places. The word Trinity means tri-unity or three in oneness. It is used to summarize the teaching of scripture that God is three persons, yet one God. And thus, we can understand the term expresses the truth that God exists as a tri-unity of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. These three divine members are equal to one another in essence, substance, and character, even though they are distinct persons with functional differences. But this understanding of God has not always been the case. Because the word Trinity does not appear anywhere in the Bible, Opponents of the doctrine of the Trinity allege that it was an invention of the church at the Council of Nicaea in the year 325. But allow me to suggest to you that although the term Trinity does not appear in scripture, the concept is inherently biblical. The Trinitarian nature of God was revealed implicitly in the Old Testament and explicitly in the New Testament. Now, for instance, we know that there is but one God who is like no other from passages like Isaiah chapter 46, verse 9, that reads, For I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is no other like me. We also know that God exists in three distinct personhoods. And Jesus refers to God the Father as an entity separate from himself. For instance, in John 17, verse 1, Jesus says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son also may glorify you. We know that the Son is separate from God the Father from passages such as Isaiah 9, 6, that prophesies, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. As well, we know that the Son was also God from passages like John chapter 1, verse 1, that announces, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We also know that the Spirit is separate from the Son and the Father because of passages like John 14, verses 16 through 17, where Jesus says, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. And we know that the spirit is God from passages like Genesis 1 verse 2 that tells of God's spirit hovering over the face of the waters. And from Acts chapter 5 where Peter tells Ananias that Satan filled his heart to lie to the Holy Spirit. And in doing so, he has not only lied to men, but to God. And so we can see that the concept of the Trinity has its roots within the Bible. 
But what about the claim that the Trinity was an invention of the church at the Council of Nicaea in the year 325? Well, theologian Nathan Businetz carefully studied the language of the early church before the year 325 and concluded that the church fathers frequently employed Trinitarian language to describe the nature and work of God. On one hand, they declared themselves to be monotheists who believed in the one and only God. And on the other hand, they clearly affirmed that one God has eternally existed as three distinct persons, each of whom is equally and fully God. <laughs> and so for us today, while well, the mystery of how the triune God exists might not be any clearer to us than when we began, we can at least be confident in the biblical grounding of the Trinity and that it was part of the church from its earliest days. And perhaps the reason why we have such a hard time understanding the Trinity goes back to Isaiah 46, verse 9, where God tells us, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no other like me. And since there is no other like him, we have nothing to compare him to, nothing to help us grasp the, the mystery of our faith. While we may not be able to fully comprehend the Trinity, it doesn't mean that the Trinity is meaningless to us. For in the Trinity, we are witnesses to a remarkable relationship, unlike any other in our world. According to classical Trinitarian theology, the three persons of the Trinity have their distinctive identity only, only in the deep, inseparable relationship with each other. The great Eastern Orthodox theologian of the seventh century, John of Damascus, describes this relationship using the word, the Greek word, perichoresis which we translate as mutual indwelling or being in one another. And one of the best descriptions of this indwelling relationship comes from contemporary theologian, Daniel McGillory. And he writes, the three of the Trinity indwell and pervade each other. They encircle each other, being united as it were in an exquisite divine dance. Or to use still another metaphor, they make room for each other and are incomparably hospitable to each other. So what can we, the faithful, take away from the example of the triune God's relationship? Why is the Trinitarian viewpoint meaningful us meaningful to us today? And how does it relate to our daily living? Well, first, let me suggest to you that it is this indwelling relationship that is perhaps the most meaningful to us, for it sets forth the way in which the triune God relates to us. Whether, whether we are relating to God the Father, God the Son, or God the Spirit, the way in which God relates to us is by dwelling in us. God is a part of us, a part of our being. And we too are wound up in this mysterious yet divine dance. Now, while we humans are in no way the, the perfect and holy vessels for God to dwell in, through his love for us, God still chooses to dwell within us, to enter our being and to enter our consciousness in order to reveal himself to us. So we may experience God's love and God's ways. Now, the evidence of this comes from our declarations when we say such things as we can feel the peace of Christ washing over us, or when we say we can feel the spirit moving in us, or urging and leading us onward. 
are when we are simply overcome by the majesty and power of God and fall to our knees and give thanks to God for all that he has done for us. We, we feel God within us, indwelling in us, inviting us into relationship with him to miraculously have that same mutual indwelling. Imagine, just imagine what people we could become if we truly allow God to indwell in us instead of fighting God with our egos and listening to Satan's voice of rejection. Secondly, the triune God's deep, inseparable relationship, this perichoresis, sets out how we are to relate to each other. We too are supposed to make room for each other. Be incomparably hospitable with each other and appreciate each other's distinct personhood. It is this heavenly community, this triune relationship where no one person dominates over another, where resources are shared, where each person is solely motivated by love and not by power or greed. God, God gives us the example of what our communities of faith and the world he created are to be like through God's own divine triune relationship. Imagine, imagine what a community we could create if we were to follow God's example and truly made room for each other, made room for all at God's table. And so my friends on this Trinity Sunday, God is reminding us, reminding all of us what kind of indwelling relationship he wants he desires to have with us. That is the mystery of the triune God. God in three persons seeks to come to us in the personhood we need most in our current circumstances. Now, sometimes we will need the Father as our loving parent and creator, Sometimes we'll need the Son as our sibling or Savior, and sometimes we'll need the Spirit as our companion and advocate. Whichever one, whichever one your heart is calling out to today and in the days to come, know that God of the Holy Trinity, the one true triune God, will attend to you. Be with you dwell within you. For you are loved by the triune God, mysterious and unequaled, and yet so familiar and all loving. And so, my sisters and brothers, know that in God, one plus one plus one does indeed equal one. The one, the one that came for you. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Spirit, may it always be so. Amen. Well, my friends, we have been reminded today who God is. Three persons, yet one God. And that God wants to dwell within us. He desires deeply to have that mutual indwelling with each of us. And so let us declare our belief in our holy God as we hear and sing our responsive worship song, This is Our God, performed by Sovereign Grace.
sent to save us, born unto a virgin, lived a perfect life, greatly suffered, dying for us from the grave. He's risen, seated now on high. Judge the living and the dead. Usher in the age to come. Let everyone sing. Amen. Jesus will come back again. Judge the living and the dead. Well, this day we come before the Lord with our prayers, asking for his intercession, asking for his hand in the needs of the people. And so we raise up today the First Nation of Tecumloops Te Sekep Wetmog, and just we raise them up for healing. Um, we know, Lord, that you've already taken up and cared for those souls of the 215 children, and perhaps more. But we just raise up that First Nation, uh, that band, as they deal with uh, this new revelation. We also raise up to you uh, Mike Machnik, who is the husband of Pastor Rita, who was with us on uh, Christmas Eve. Um, Mike has suffered some uh, back injuries and, and lower back pain over the last month or so, and uh, his condition has worsened over the, the last uh, few weeks. And uh, so we pray for him as he goes uh, uh, into hospital for treatment, and uh, we pray for Pastor Rita as well as, as she cares for him. We pray for um, all those university-bound students who have to make a decision on where they are going uh, before the deadline on June 1st. We pray that you would guide them in their decision-making, help uh, them and then their family members to make a 
a decision that you have already planned out for them. Uh, we pray for our sister, Dr. Jackie, uh, who is uh, working to prepare for an audit um, of her uh, practice by the College of Physicians and Surgeons, and that's going to happen on uh, June the, the 17th. And uh, so we um, pray that she will have the energy and the um, attention to be able to focus on preparing for that as she cares for her um, patients as well. Oh, Alan's asking me something, but I can't see it. So I'm just going to reach out here and grab the piece of paper here. Um, ah, yes. This is good news. I would have never been able to see this <laughs> with my poor eyesight and the dark lighting here. No way, no way. <laughs> um, we had prayed previously um, for Blossom and for her surgery, and Alan has uh, told me that all went well. So praise God. Thank you, God, for um, all that you did to be with the doctors and nurses and with uh, Blossom and with Chris as she went into the surgery. Uh, we continue to pray for uh, nations around the world and people around the world who continue to suffer with the coronavirus. We pray for the nation of Vietnam who have discovered this new variant that no one knew about. And so we pray for the people there. When we pray for the doctors and nurses and healthcare workers who continue to uh, go out and serve and care for all those who are in need. We also pray for those who surgeries has, have been postponed and the, the care that they need has been postponed. We know that they are worried um, and their families are worried. So we pray for them as well. We continue to pray for our essential and um, uh, all of our essential workers as they go out uh, as well to make life happen for all of us. And of course, uh, we pray for your faithful here at St. Andrews as we continue to discern what ministry and mission will be for us and how we can best serve the mission, your mission, God. So now let us offer our prayers of thanksgiving and intercession through Christ who perfects our prayers. Let us pray. Holy Trinity, our one holy God, whose power is beyond compare, with glory beyond our understanding, whose mercy is boundless and love for us is endless. Look upon us this day in your compassion. We offer our humble prayers to you. We pray for peace that calms our hearts and saves our souls, and for peace in the whole world and throughout creation. We pray for the stability of the church and the unity of this congregation for all who desire to follow you with faith and with reverence, and for the ministries of the Presbyterian Church in Canada and your church around the world in these challenging times. We pray for those who serve, for healthcare workers, for essential workers, for community leaders, for your faithful servants, and for all who offer themselves up to serve with diligence and compassion as the months of the pandemic stretch on. We pray for nurturing relationships between cultures and communities, for healing of old hurts, and for repentance and reconciliation, for new and better ways to walk with one another in respect and care, to be able to say we're sorry, to be able to create indwelling relationships and to make room for all at your table. We pray for the sick, the suffering and the isolated for victims of violence, refugees and captives, and for your protection against all oppression, danger and distress. To you, Holy God, Father, Son and Spirit, we offer now in this moment of silence our personal prayers of intercession and need locked deep within our hearts. O Holy God, who is Father, Son, and Spirit, we pray these and all our prayers for the glory of your name. And so now encourage us onward to do the work of your kingdom as we say together the prayer you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, our Father who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those that sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Hello again, everyone. Donations can be paid online through our partnership with CanDaHelps.org. Go to www.CanDaHelps.org slash EN slash DN slash 56495. Or donations can be mailed or delivered to St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church, 9860 Keel Street, Vaughan, Ontario, L6A 3Y4. Well, remember last week's mission moment was all about healing and reconciliation. And so it really did sadden me to hear of what Robert was talking earlier about the location of a mass grave at a residential school uh, operated by the Roman Catholic Church in Canloos. And it just goes to show you that truth and healing and reconciliation, it's not just a quick, I'm sorry, and it's done. It's an ongoing process, and it's a process that we continue to deal with, and we will continue to deal with. And But ultimately, we always have to look to God for direction and for uh, forgiveness for our sins and the power and the strength to move on and move together going forward. But today's mission moment is also dealing with oppression, Supporting Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh. Four years ago, the Myanmar military began a campaign of violent attacks against the Rohingya, widespread killing, torture, robbery, and assault, forced over 700,000 Rohingya from their homes and into neighboring Bangladesh. Presbyterian World Service and Development, PWSND, responded and continues to do so. We're providing life-saving food assistance and temporary shelter and ensuring that social, psychosocial support is available to those who need it. To help prevent the spread of COVID-19 in the crowded refugee camps, PWSND is helping ensure families have access to water, sanitation, and hygiene facilities. Families are also receiving food vouchers to help meet nutritional needs and boost the local economy. So remember, these are just some of the good works that are being done by the church uh, around the world. And you can assist in that regard. Remember, you can fill in those other two boxes on your envelopes or also uh, in the online, you can do the pull down menu and you can dedicate funds for specific purposes. So I do encourage you uh, to give and support in that regard. And just uh, setting my screen. There we go. And just another reminder that we are continuing our series of uh, Zoom Bible studies with Fabrizio Piazza. Uh, and they are on Thursdays at 7.30. Uh, for those who received the email from me, the link is on there. And uh, I also tried to send out a reminder. This last week, so last Thursday, was on the 70-week, or you can actually interpret that to be 490-year uh, prophecy of Daniel. Um, that prophesied the coming and, uh, and uh, crucifixion of Christ. And so uh, that was very interesting. Uh, it was, uh, it's the kind of thing that if you just sat down and read the Bible and you read Daniel, you'd be, oh, okay, that's interesting. What does that mean? And that's where getting some scholarly, scholarly help uh, really helps. And, uh, and then you see, and then you can see how it approaches. And so thank you very much to Fabrizio for bringing that to us last Thursday. And I encourage you to join us uh, this Thursday at 7.30 over Zoom. And I don't know the topic yet. I'll let it, uh, Fabrizio usually lets me know a couple of days before, and then I try to get that out to you. But I do encourage you to join. Remember, no preparation required. You just come, you can listen. You don't have to say anything. You can just sit and learn. Or of course, you're welcome to uh, participate and speak and give your thoughts about how you interpreted something. So I encourage you all to do that. I look forward to seeing you on Thursday. 
And now back to Robert. Well, thank you for your continued support of God's mission and ministry here at St. Andrews. Let us now dedicate our offering through prayer. Let us pray. Holy One, you challenge all your followers to, to give, to give to others by denying our selfish needs. Receive now our gifts as we are able, joyfully given as your flock, in gratitude for all you have done for us. May they be multiplied to accomplish more than we can ask or even imagine for your glory. Bless us too, so that our lives will speak of our, of our choice to, to follow you, our holy triune God. And may our ministries and missions offer others the healing and reconciliation and hope you have offered us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As well, I was so overjoyed to hear of uh, Blossom's successful surgery that I totally forgot to raise up the new graduates from Knox College, which is our theological seminary, the Presbyterian Church's theological seminary here in Toronto. The graduation ceremony was um, this past Thursday on May the 27th. And so there were eight new uh, graduates with the Master of Divinity who will go out into the world, into congregational ministry. And there were eight new graduates of the Masters of Pastoral Studies program. And they will take their skills and learning out into the world of counseling. And then there are eight graduates with advanced degrees uh, from masters to uh, doctorate degrees. And they will go on uh, to help the church in doing research and in, in teaching. So congratulations to those graduates. And uh, we raise them up to you, O oh Lord, asking that you would help them to find the place that you have intended for them in the world. And so my friends, know that no matter what name you call upon, Father, Son, or Spirit, that God, God will answer you and indwell within you. And know too that your heart, your heart will forever cry out to God to be in relationship with the triune God and that your heart will forever bless his holy name. And so let us do just that, confidently singing our faith with our closing worship song, Blessed Be Your Name, performed by the Village Chapel Worship Team. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. When I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the dark Closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. Shining down on me 
when the world's all as it should be. Let's be a day. Let's it be your name on the road marked with suffering. Though there's pain in the offering, bless it be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. You give and take away, you give and take away, my heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name, you give and take away, oh, you give and take away, but my heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Well, dear sisters and brothers, go into the day in the days to come, knowing that your life, your life has been touched by the triune God. You are cleansed by the mercy of God. You are surrounded by the love of Christ, and you are filled with the power of the Spirit. And until we see each other again, may God's grace, peace, and love be yours in abundance, firm in the knowledge that God of the Trinity will forever, forever dwell within you, and restore your soul. Amen. And so my friends, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May you be reminded of this as we hear our sung benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you to shine upon you and be gracious and be gracious unto you.
my friends, this ends our time of worship today. And the worship team here in the sanctuary, it has been such a joy, such a pleasure to worship with you today. Thank you for joining with us in worship. And I invite you to stay online for some fellowship time. It'll just probably be five or 10 minutes after the service. And so until next time, from the worship team here in the sanctuary, from Jackie, Valerie, Alan, and myself, and from all the elders here at St. Andrews, from all of us to all of you, may God continue to bless you and all whom you love and care for and keep you safe. Amen. We'll see you next time.